we've been talking about the tissues that invest and wrap the back, and some of them are muscles, some of them are fascial tissues, but how much is too much? I mean, how do tissues adapt, and what's a tipping point where we might be overstressing them? Right, the search for the biological tipping point is uh, a very necessary discussion for every yoga instructor to have. Um, if I can uh, establish a, a few concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, so all tissues, as we've already established, have a tipping point in terms of optimal health. If we're under the tipping point, we're creating beneficial adaptation. But when we cross the tipping point, the stress starts to tear tissue down. But it does so in several different ways. So I'm going to use a graph now, and we're going to have time across the uh, x-axis and load across the y-axis. Here is the strength of the tissue. Now the tissue might be a person's disc, it might be a vertebra, it might be the end plate, it might be a facet joint, whatever that tissue happens to be. But that's its strength or tolerance right there. So we're going to apply a load through a movement or a pose and then we're going to take the load away. We see we have a margin of safety here. We didn't reach the tipping point, right. that's healthy. But in the second cycle of load, we're going to keep on increasing the magnitude until it reaches the strength, and that's where the injury will occur. You've exceeded the load-bearing ability of that tissue. Um, so that's a common way to experience a back injury or an injury anywhere uh, mm -hmm. in the body. But these are other much more likely scenarios that don't get discussed very much. Consider a yoga class where a pose might be held for a period of time, a static pose, but it's a safe load. Let's apply a safe load and we're going to keep it there for a period of time now. Now in biology, all tissues have the property of viscoelasticity and we always have fun with the yes. word creep. When you put a load on a viscoelastic tissue, it slowly elongates and deforms to the applied stress. So let's uh, squeeze an end plate, for example, with a particular pose. There's the strength of the end plate, but over time, creeping takes place, micro movements. Now bone will creep to about 2% and then it breaks. So interestingly enough, we're now creeping that tissue and the margin of safety is going smaller and the injury will occur after a certain amount of time, even though it's a safe load. Sufficient creep will, will occur, deformation, and then the injury uh, will occur. So there are some people that hold poses far too long and can actually creep to micro damage, just at a micro level. If they do that day after day, they will uh, increase the, the consequences. Here's another uh, likely scenario as well. The second property of uh, tissues after viscoelasticity is fatigue. So if I took a credit card, a plastic credit card, and bent it back and forth, the stress strain reversals would cause cumulative stress and a stress crack. If I kept doing it, it will sizzle through and actually fracture. So we create exactly the same kind of fatigue buildup. Um, I'm now going to apply a safe cycle of load and take it away over and over and over again. A safe load. However, through the property of fatigue, we modulate the strength of the tissue and a uh, failure will occur on the nth repetition of load, whatever that happens to be. Well, that's so the last straw. Effect. That is the last straw, that that might occur very rarely within a session. This is something where inappropriate programming in a class has just built up too much stress over time. So now we talk about the magic of adaptation and why do we do yoga? Why do we train? When you think about it, I hope it's to create adaptation. So you're not creating health specifically while you're doing the exercise. What you're doing is a stimulus for the body to adapt. And then some people don't honor the rest period. It's the rest period after the training during which the tissue adapts to whatever the chronic stress has been, whether it's a strength or a mobility or, or whatever. So the trick 
to health and creating the adaptation now is let's apply load, go to class. It's a very healthy thing to do. There's the strength of the tissue and its resilience, but no question, during the loading, it's going to creep and fatigue and you will actually decrease its tolerance a tiny bit, but you maintain the sufficient level of tolerance. Now you're wise and you have a rest period. Over the rest period, the tolerance, if you were wise, now adapted to a level higher than what we started with. Good training. And then off you go on your next cycle of uh, stimulus and repeat. So that is the art and science of good training, programming, uh, rehabilitation, and uh, enhancing athletic performance. So, in other words, the tissues you just used become more usable after the rest period. That's correct. Right? It's kind of funny that sometimes in a yoga classroom, there'll be one student who hates Shavasana. That's the refractory period at the end of the practice. They'll, you know, they've got other things they can do. They'll, they'll run off and it's just a waste of time. We're just doing nothing. And yet, from what you're showing, that's the most important part. I mean, everything else is useless if you don't have the rest period in there. And, and you just identified the most unwise student in the class. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, they're busy. Yeah. The other thing, in your last draw effect on the kind of the middle graph there, I know there's anecdotes in the yoga industry of some student who comes to class and maybe does pigeon pose and everyone hears a loud pop and everyone's freaked out about it and she gets up and hobbles out and the, the teacher is very solicited and says, oh, are you okay, are you okay? And she says, fine, fine. And then two weeks later, the letter comes from the lawyer saying, it was in your class, I hurt my hip. And they sue the student, uh, the teacher, sorry, they sue the studio. And yet what they didn't talk about was how that woman had just run a marathon the day before and was snowboarding the morning before that. And she comes into class and she comes into a simple pose and something gives. And now they blame the last straw. We like to blame the proximal event for all the injuries. But what you're showing, it could be the accumulation of a lot of things. Yeah, in, when I'm called as an expert witness in uh, legal cases involving injury, uh, this is called the culminating event. But that's all it was there was a cumulative stress that needed to be examined to determine how close they were or how much of their biological capacity they'd used up doing other things. So you can't have it all. Right. And uh, it's so interesting when you study the training practices of some of the great athletes and members of the public might think they are slightly undertrained, mm -hmm. but they are so clever in building training capacity and making sure that when they do train, they have sufficient reserve and they don't cross the tipping point.